Scott here with another episode of the History Unplugged podcast. The golden age of piracy happened in the 18th century Caribbean, but piracy itself has existed long before that. The Vikings committed plenty of piracy in the Middle Ages. In the Mediterranean, the Ottomans dealt with pirates, as did the Romans, the Greeks, and the Carthaginians before them. So really, piracy is baked into every historical record of every civilization that had seagoing commerce and bandits, which is basically anywhere that had a body of water. If that's the case, why do we only associate piracy, this timeless phenomena, with the 1700s with men who had eye patches and parrots on their shoulders? To explore this question and many more is today's guest, Catherine Howe, author of the Penguin Book of Pirates. We look at all sorts of episodes from pirate history, such as a man's body hanged in chains as a warning against piracy on a rock at the mouth of Boston Harbor in 1726, the pirates who resided along the Texas-Louisiana border that did a brisk business selling enslaved people who had been kidnapped from Spanish ships. We also look at the notorious pirate town full of Europeans and Americans and Africans on a tiny tropical paradise off the coast of Madagascar, and a very interesting figure, an Englishman who converted to Islam and terrorized the Barbary Coast. Part of the reasons pirates are so romanticized is that they represent the idea of freedom and leaving behind obligations. But an overlooked aspect that we'll explore is that they were also heavily involved in unfreedom, particularly the slave trade, as this was a significant source of revenue and profit for pirates. Piracy was a timeless and also time-bound phenomenon that ebbs and flows with national and international strength as it can be projected over international waterways. And I hope you enjoy this discussion with Catherine Howe. There are many places to start with the story, but one that is as good as any is your personal connection to piracy. Specifically, your fifth great-grandfather who battled pirates twice and a bit of family lore that says he was strung up by his thumbs. So was he actually strung up by his thumbs? And what is that all about? (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah, when I was small, I had this formidable Yankee grandmother. She was from Concord, Massachusetts, and she wore keds and she was very practical and always wore a cardigan. And she would tell us, like, there, we didn't grow up with a whole lot of, like, family lore all that much. But one that we did grow up with was hearing about this distant guy who had been, quote, strung up by his thumbs by pirates, unquote. And this was a guy who was named Zachary or Zachariah Gage Lampson. He was a mariner out of Beverly, Massachusetts. And he started out his career, I want to say, as a cabin boy in 1797. And he had kind of a checkered career at sea, like a lot of mariners did. He, you know, he kind of rose through the ranks. He became master of a ship called the Belvedere. And he had, at one point, his children urged him to write a memoir because he'd had so many kind of crazy adventures. And so he started one. He had a partial memoir that was left behind in manuscript form, a kind of cuts off in the middle of his adventures in the 1820s. And he ends up dying of fever in Grenada in 1846. So the manuscript itself was then edited and contextualized by, I want to say like a third great grandfather, a guy named Octavius T. Howe, who was actually kind of a a historian by avocation. He, in actual fact, was a doctor, but he really enjoyed maritime history in particular, and especially the maritime history of Salem and Beverly and the North Shore of Massachusetts. And so O.T., which is what he went by, published a book about Zachariah Lampson, which came out in the 1920s. And it's a surprisingly well-researched history book, actually. I'm kind of impressed by his chops because he went into, he has all these sorts of footnotes from the Salem Gazette because at that time, newspapers would list the comings and goings of ships and also news that had been heard from ships that had not yet put in a port. And so it turns out what happened was that Zachary Lampson was a sailing master who was master of a ship called the Belvedere. And at one point, he was captured by pirates and strung up by his neck from a yardarm, but let down. So strung up slowly and then let down as kind of a incentive for him to tell his captors, you know, where any valuables were kept on board. But this is not like a golden age of piracy kind of story. This is an early 19th century piracy story when there was a lot of piracy, less in the Caribbean, but more around the Gulf of Mexico. And as I get into in the book, The Penguin Book of Pirates, by the time we get to the 19th century, the, we don't none of the cargo that pirates are seizing would count as anyone's definition of treasure. You know, we're talking about shoes, coffee, you know, really very basic kind of stuff. But Lampson was so determined not to be molested by pirates again. He was trading between Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and New Orleans. 
But this was after the Haitian Revolution. So it was actually a time when it was kind of quasi-illegal what he was doing because the United States had tried to discourage American mariners from trading with Haiti because they didn't want to seem to support the Haitian Revolution's purposes because, of course, the United States was still a slave-holding slave holding country. So he was in this kind of quasi-legal maritime world where so many people tended to function. And he was attacked by pirates again on the Belvedere. And this time he was prepared for them. And so he had actually armed his merchant vessel. And there's a pretty fun description that comes from his ship log of the Belvedere, which ended up being published in some sources, you know, kind of contemporaneous to when it happened, because it was kind of an exciting story, and then got republished subsequently in various stories about piracy in the Gulf and in the Caribbean into the 19th century. And my favorite is that he referred to it as he found he had a pretty hard character to deal with. And it seems like the pirate ship that attacked him really did raise some kind of version of a Jolly Roger, which is how he knew what they were up against. And so I was struck by a couple things about this, not least of which was that he was successful in his defense of his cargo. And you wouldn't think that insurance underwriting would be an exciting part of the piracy story. But one of the reasons that we know about this story is because the Louisiana Insurance Company, which was the underwriter of his trading voyage with Haiti, rewarded him for his defense of the cargo by giving him a coin silver service, which I now have two pieces. And it actually has engraving on the side. I think I have the creamer and maybe the sugar bowl or something. And it says, you know, for your gallant defense of, of our, from the Louisiana Insurance Company, for your gallant defense of cargo, you know, against pirates. And so one thing that I think is interesting is, you know, the role that insurance plays in in valuation and in these sort of encounters between people in the maritime world. I think it's more exciting than people might realize. That raises a bunch of important points. One, these pirates, I'm fairly strongly willing to guess, didn't have the hats we think of with pirates or parrots on their shoulders or peg legs or anything else like that. But that one would immediately think that when you tell the story shows we associate piracy so much with the 18th century and the golden age of piracy, all the accoutrements in Pirates of the Caribbean. But that time period doesn't own pirates. We have pirates today, as we're seeing off the... Right this minute, we have pirates. Right. That's one of the big news stories off the coast of Yemen. There were issues in Somalia. It goes back to the Middle Ages. Vikings loved piracy up in the Baltic Sea and North Seas. The Romans dealt with pirates in the Mediterranean and uh, Greeks and the Carthaginians before them. So piracy goes back to as long as there's been shipping lines and robbers. And it's just as much of history as temples, taxation. But we think of a guy with a hat and an eye patch in the 18th century. So what is it about this time period that created the image of piracy that we all think of? A couple of theories about that. And I'm curious if you agree with them. And I think, so one theory is that much of what you just described in talking about piracy, so looking at the Houthis in the Red Sea right now, they are breaking maritime law, but they are acting essentially at the behest of warlords. They're kind of like a an illegal navy in a way. And the so-called Barbary pirates, the coast of Tripoli and, and so forth in the beginning of the 19th century, and even many of the pirates active in the early 19th century in the South China Sea, were a similar kind of structure in which they were maritime raiders who were acting with the backing of, and in some cases at the behest of, land-based warlords. So they were kind of in this quasi-naval role. They just weren't sanctioned by an official government. And one thing that I think is a little bit different about the 18th century is that we associate pirates with these individual people who have gone out, as it were, on their own account. You know, people who have staged a mutiny, seized the control of their ship, thrown off the shackles of their oppressors, effectively. And we're more attracted to the anarchist version of pirates than we are to the quasi-legal warlord version of pirates. I think that that's one reason that we tend to romanticize the 17th century and 18th century pirates so much. Part of it, too, has to do, I think, with popular culture. You know, it was kind of the 1700s was the beginning of really widespread print culture, you know, the invention of the novel form, for example. And so there are many cases of best-selling, like runaway best-selling accounts of piracy that were written kind of contemporaneous to when they were happening, like A General History of the Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson. And we still haven't totally settled on the identity of who Captain Charles Johnson is. But so many of the pirates that we think we know, like Blackbeard or Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, 
the accounts of their exploits were described in a book that was first published in 1724. And then again, many of those kind of romantic notions about pirates. One thing that I found interesting in researching Penguin Book of Pirates was there was a generation of so-called Golden Age Caribbean region pirates in the 1600s. And their exploits were widely disseminated in broadside, in popular stories and popular narratives, sometimes in plays. Jack Ward, who you and I were talking about before we started recording, his exploits were widely kind of publicized and romanticized at the beginning of the 17th century. And so there's a generation of guys who come of age in oftentimes colonial holdings and who've heard all these pirate stories. And so by the time you get to the early 1700s, you have a generation of guys who style themselves as pirates. They're really pirates, but they also really subscribe to this romantic notion, the way that it has been popularized in popular culture. Then I think a third factor has to do with the 19th century and the way that popular fiction in the 19th century turned to the 18th century in its pirate telling. I think the most classic example is, of course, Treasure Island, which is by Robert Louis Stevenson and was published in the 1880s, I want to say. And But it's about the 1750s, give or take. And similarly, Peter and Wendy, the novel version of Peter Pan, which has the other big popular representation of a pirate, Captain Hook, that we can't get away from. That was published in the early part of the 20th century. And many aspects of Captain Hook's dress and demeanor and points of reference, you can really trace specific antecedents to kind of popular representations of pirates from the 1600s and the beginning part of the 1700s. But then I think the fourth major reason why we tend to romanticize piracy in the 18th century specifically is because it is a way for us to overwrite and otherwise ignore the transatlantic slave trade. Because we're talking about piracy, we're talking about treasure. The romantic picture of pirates is always about things. It's never about people. And of course, the entire maritime world and the wealth that was moving over the waters, specifically in the Atlantic region in the 17th and 18th century, was based on enslaved labor. And so I think that there's a way where pirate stories that privilege treasure and objects allows us to kind of turn away from the reality of the value of enslaved labor in that time period. That's my theory. I'm curious if any of those theories align with what your take is. That's very comprehensive. I can't think of anything to add to that except the reason that we historicize piracy and think of it as something that happens at another time and not our time. There's a quirk of history right now from the post-World War II era, roughly until today, although it's freeing around the edges, of largely stable trade on the high seas. Due to the Blue Otter Navy of the United States, shipping routes are largely kept secure. I mentioned freeing on the edges, things like Somali pirates shown in Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks. We mentioned pirates on the coast of Yemen. And as international trade networks, if they break down like some political scientists think they will, if the world becomes more decentralized, then there's no reason this vacuum couldn't be filled back in. And piracy will not be historicized. So it'll be something like burglary or looting. We don't think of particular people or places when we think of burglars. We think of news accounts and things that are happening on the evening news. But yeah, I think you've hit all the major points there. And with the point you made on piracy involved in the slave trade, there's a tension you mentioned at the heart of piracy between freedom and unfreedom. And that gets gets into one of the interesting questions about piracy in the area you cover from the 16th to 19th centuries of why somebody decides to become a pirate. And we can look at this on the side of freedom, of somebody who's trying to leave his circumstances. Maybe he's enlisted in the Navy, which already feels like being on a prison ship, so you really don't have much to lose. Becoming a pirate isn't entering a life of crime. It's more like a prison break at that point. But what are the reasons that you saw for somebody to become a pirate in this time period? The vast majority of them seem to be people who did not set out to become pirates, but sort of became pirates, either because the circumstances of their commission changed around them in one instance. So William Kidd, for instance, was actually, he was based in New York, although he was I think originally Scottish, if I'm not mistaken. His original charge was to hunt out pirates who were menacing the fishing fleets on the Grand Banks. And so that was his original charge. And by the time his career came to an end, he was, you know, captured 
with a crew of, I think it was 90 Moors is what one of the sources that I saw said. He had been out raiding. His crew had been promised a percentage of whatever prizes they took, but then they didn't find any prizes to take. And so they ended up raiding illegally. And so they ended up being on the wrong side of the law. So he became kind of as circumstances changed around him, he became the thing that he had set out to hunt. So there's one circumstance where you go from essentially having a legitimate privateering commission to having a change in the definition of what you're doing rather than the fact of what you're doing. In another instance, you know, some of your other famous pirates of the past, like Henry Morgan, Henry Morgan is a hero to England, but he is considered a pirate to Spain because of the different political perspectives of the two countries at play. But I think the most compelling one, just for me personally, is, you know, the common seaman or the common sailor who ends up a pirate because he can't stand it anymore. You know, I think one of the better examples of these is William Fly, who was the guy who, William Fly was a, a common mariner who was on a ship called the Elizabeth in 1726. And he was subject to what the sources call hard usage. I don't know what that means, but it could mean any number of things, particularly as Samuel Johnson famously noted that being in prison was preferable to being in the Navy because being in the Navy was like being in prison with the added risk of being drowned. So William Fly couldn't withstand the hard usage anymore. And so he and a couple of his Confederates seized control of the ship. They staged a mutiny. They threw the master overboard. They cut off the arm of his first lieutenant and chucked him into the ocean. And they renamed the ship the Fame's Revenge and went raiding off Cape Hatteras. And we know about William Fly because he ended up not being able to navigate on his own because being a common seaman, he had probably not gone to a navigation school. And navigation was a very specific skill set at that time, very different from the skill set required to actually sail a ship. So he kidnapped a fisherman to make him navigate them to Martha's Vineyard so that they could get water and food. And the fisherman tricked them, instead took them all the way around the outside of Cape Cod to just outside of Boston because the fisherman knew that there was increased sort of policing around piracy at that time and that he stood a good chance of being rescued. So the fame's revenge was captured and William Fly was put on trial publicly in Boston. And then he was hanged and then he was gibbeted. And the thing I love about William Fly is, and in fact, his hanging opens my recent novel about pirates, which is called A True Account, Hannah Missouri's Sojourn Amongst the Pirates, written by herself. William Fly was this unusual case in that he refused to apologize. He refused to repent, even though Cotton Mather, the same guy who oversaw the Salem Witch Trials, browbeat him and browbeat him and browbeat him and subjected him to all kinds of public humiliation and despair. And on the scaffold, William Fly did two things that I think live on in infamy and that make me understand a little bit about why we romanticize Golden Age Pirates so much. One was he mounted the scaffold and he took one look at the noose and said to the hangman, don't you know your trade? And he untied the noose and then retied it in a more sailorly way, which is pretty awesome. And the second thing was that when he was called upon to repent, because his public humiliation was supposed to be, historian Marcus Redeker has talked about the importance of terror in the public persecution of pirates. So they were trying to terrify the public into being too afraid to mutiny themselves. And William Fly refused to apologize. He said his last words were, masters of vessels, do it well by your men, lest they be put upon doing as I have done. And so I think the kind of independent desperado is another model of golden age piracy that I think is the one that we're all a little bit more romantic about or more familiar with about. And then there's one other person who went pirating around this time period who went about it a totally different way, which I find kind of hilarious. And that is Steedy Bonnet. Steedy Bonnet, your listeners might be familiar with if they've been watching Our Flag Means Death. And he was a real guy. He was an enslaver. He owned a wealthy plantation. Pretty sure it was in Barbados. And he was the unusual 18th century man in that he actually had some modicum of choice or control over his life. Like most people who were living in the 18th century, had next to no control over their own lives, over what they did, over how much money they had. You know, it was a really rigid time period to be living in. Steady Bonnet had money. He had freedom. He had choice. He decided he didn't want to be a plantation holding enslaver. He wanted to be a pirate, even though he didn't know anything about sailing. He didn't know anything about maritime life, but he had plenty of money. So he bought his own ship. He kitted it out. He hired his own crew and he went pirating. And he ended up being a confederate of Blackbeard. Um, And he died on the gallows just like Blackbeard did. But Steedy Bonnet is by far the exception as the person who went to piracy out of choice. He is 
the only example, actually, that I can point to of someone who turned piracy on a whim. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a short break for a word from our sponsors. Speaking of seeking out a life of freedom, someone I'd like to bring up is Jack Ward, because this ties in the Ottoman Empire, which listeners know I'm always happy to do. Some people think he was the inspiration for Jack Sparrow and Pirates of the Caribbean. He was an Englishman who converted to Islam and joined the Barbary Pirates. And I think it's interesting because when we think of people in Europe who, due to the nature of their birth order, maybe they don't have an inheritance, the pressure release valve of the confinement of European society is usually depicted as going off to the New World. But Jack found another option, and that was piracy. Well, Jack was also working a little bit before going to the New World was really an option. I mean, he was like, because he was active in the, around the same decade that Jamestown was founded, if I'm not mistaken. Right. This is very early in the colonization of the New World. So what were his choices of becoming a pirate and what happened in his career? Jack Ward was kind of fascinating. I mean, he is one of these guys who ends up being so widely celebrated in broadsides. His pirate nickname ended up being Shakur, which I think means axe. You probably can correct me on that one. But he became infamous for not only how brutal he was, but also how much money he was able to make. He was actually such a successful raider that England tried to kind of broker a peace with him. They tried to. There are several instances during the golden age of piracy in which various countries tried to offer blanket amnesties to pirates in order to get them to cut it out. And Jack Ward was one of those where they tried to offer him an amnesty in order to get him to cut it out. He also reportedly had two wives. He married, uh, I think, a woman from Italy while he was still technically sending money home to his wife in England. And one of my favorite is the quote or the author, one of my favorite pirate quotes, which almost sounds like a toast. And it's from like the first the primary source account of Jack Ward. And it goes something like, my mates, quoth he, what's to be done? Here's a scurvy world, and as scurvily we live in it. We feed here upon the water, upon the king's salt beef, without air penny to buy us bissel when we go ashore. Here's meat, good for ravening stomachs, but where's your brim cup and your full carouse to make a merry heart? And I love that so much because it speaks, not only does it sound wonderfully piratey, But it also speaks to that desire for plenty and ease, you know, to reference Bartholomew Roberts, you know, the desire of regular people to have wealth and full stomachs and good meat and good food. And in some ways, Jack Ward found a path to that, which would have been denied him as a common laborer working in a maritime community in the very early part of the 17th century. Another part about pirates that are romanticized are the multi-ethic, multilingual makeup of crews. So I think, for example, if you're trying to try somebody for piracy, court records would list their ports of origin instead of their countries of birth, since that could get very, very muddled. And another fun fact, international law has much to thank to piracy because much international law and international maritime law was birthed out of piracy when different nations were trying to figure out When did somebody commit a crime and say England versus Spain versus elsewhere? And they had to come up with conditions that, well, if the port of origin is this, then they're tried under this law and all these other complications that come in. One particular site that shows off this multicultural makeup is St. Mary's Island off the coast of Madagascar. So can you tell me about this place, but then also what that says about this type of cultural fusion that happens in the world of piracy? Well, it's not really just the world of piracy. I mean, in many respects, there have been some writers who've pointed to the literal quality of the maritime world, that people who made their lives on the sea, whether they were within the bounds of legality or outside the bounds of legality, in some respects had more in common with each other than they did with landsmen, wherever they happened to have been born. And St. Mary's is actually a fascinating example because pirates who were raiding around the Atlantic world and then as far into the Indian Ocean, because at this time, of course, you know, travel was global, pretty much, needed a a safe harbor. And although there were a few notorious pirate nests in the Caribbean, the Bahamas are one, or Roatan Island in the coast of Honduras, there's actually a really terrific history book on the role of pirate nests in the British Empire, which I can recommend. 
One of the most notorious pirate nests wound up being St. Mary's Island, which is off the coast of Madagascar, which is itself an island off the coast of Africa. And it was kind of, uh, you know, far enough away from the centers of power that pirates could put in there. And so there are many accounts in the early part of the 18th century of pirates meeting each other at St. Mary's. You know, Thomas II ended up at St. Mary's, William Kidd ended up at St. Mary's. There was a wreck that was discovered at St. Mary's not too terribly long ago that at first they thought might have been the Adventure Prize, which belonged to William Kidd, although I think that has since been disproven. But there's also this idea that there was a kind of anarchist community of pirates founded on St. Mary's called Libertalia, which may or may not be somewhat apocryphal, but there is some primary source evidence to suggest that there were people who were of you know maritime heritage who ended up settling on St. Mary's and intermarrying or settling down with women who were indigenous to St. Mary's or indigenous to Madagascar and creating this kind of unique community that in some respect almost reminds me of the community on Pitcairn Island, like the community that was made by the combination of sailors who mutinied on the bounty and then settled the Tahitian women on a remote Pacific island. So I think in some ways, I think most of our popular culture representations of pirate ships is actually pretty monolithic. And from what I've been able to see, it is more accurate to talk about a multi-ethnic, multilingual crew of people with, from hailing from different origins and different points of call. There are also a couple of interesting examples of self-liberating people who ended up joining pirate crews. One thing that I tried to spend some time doing while working on the Penguin Book of Pirates was I tried to figure out or spend a little time figuring out what happened to enslaved people if their ship was seized by pirates. And there's actually a slave voyage database that tracks the outcome of every known and documented enslaving ship journey across the Atlantic. And there are very few instances that are marked piracy. So there, it's hard to actually find an example of what could happen. In some instances, the cargo would be redeemed, basically it would be ransomed, and then the enslaved people would, you know, their circumstances wouldn't change. In some instances, enslaved people would join the crew. In other instances, it's not entirely clear what happened to them. In the case of Jean Lafitte, one of the most notorious pirates in the Gulf Coast region in the early 19th century, who famously after being kind of a smuggler outside of New Orleans in the early part of the 19th century, was kicked out of New Orleans after the Battle of New Orleans and then settled in an extra-legal pirate community on Galveston Island in Texas, where his main source of income was raiding enslave, enslaver ships and seizing the cargo and then laundering that cargo over the Sabine River for a dollar a pound. Because at this time, it was illegal to import enslaved people in the United States, but it was still legal to own enslaved people. So there was money to be made by laundering this kind of cargo of, of people, human people. So it's, I've kind of wandered into the zone a little bit, I can tell. But one thing that I was thinking about a lot in writing about piracy during this time period was that it is this moment of conditions of radical freedom in which mariners or people living, making their living in the maritime world, in some instances, would throw off the shackles of their employment and claim more power for themselves through piracy. But in another instance, that radical freedom ran smack up against the most radical condition of unfreedom in the maritime world at that time, and that was the condition of enslavement. You have like impressment on the one side and enslavement on the other, and it's a condition of two really wild extremes. Can you say if there was a positive or negative net effect of piracy on the slave trade, for example, there are opportunities that if pirates board a slave ship, some of the slaves could potentially join the pirate crew. But you also noted that when the transatlantic slave trade is abolished by the British Empire, it still continues illegally to the New World for decades afterwards and in this way. Yeah, Spanish shipping is, you know, Jean Lafitte was raiding Spanish enslaving, enslaving ships. The Amistad was a Spanish slave ship in 1839, which ends up being a very kind of famous court case, which we can talk about later if you'd like. It's hard to say. I mean, one thing that was a little puzzling to me when looking at the Slave Voyage database was I was surprised how few of those voyages were coded as having ended in piracy. And what it made me wonder, and this would be an interesting dissertation for some intrepid graduate student with better technology chops than I have. And I wondered if it was a matter of piracy being lost in the paperwork. 
you know, I wondered if there was a different talk, getting back to talking about insurance and insurance underwriters, you know, did insurance for a vessel materially change if the vessel's voyage was impacted by piracy versus an act of God? I don't know the answer to that question, but I did wonder if there was some kind of financial incentive for a voyage to be somehow coded differently. And it's an open question. It's a hypothesis that I have because the amount of money that was at stake, the amount of, you know, how heavily armed merchant ships had to be. Look at the Belvedere. The Belvedere was a heavily armed merchant ship that was ready to defend itself in 18, whatever year that was, 20, 20 ish. It is a question that I have. So I think that. I think there's more research to be done in the archive that could actually materially explore the relationship between piracy and enslavement. They could look at like how it changed the economics of it and how it changed the outcome for enslaved people when they encountered pirates. You mentioned earlier the pirate colony off the coast of Madagascar. There are crews of pirates, sometimes very large. Blackbeard would have crews of 300. It raises interesting questions about pirate culture or the pirate code, which was skewered by the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, where at first these pirates seem to play all this fealty to the idea of a code, but then they mention, well, we are pirates, so it's more like guidelines, and they poke fun at the idea that people who are lawbreakers by profession would also not be so beholden. So in terms of a formal or informal pirate code, did things essentially offer by run by a set of unwritten rules and Breaking those could lead to ostracization or exile or getting marooned. To, essentially, how did pirate society function? Well, there actually was a written set of rules. There was a written set of articles that were based roughly, I think, on the Articles of War, which I reproduce in the Penguin Book of Pirates. And it makes sense when you think about it, because in order to operate, you know, these sailing vessels were very complex machines. You really had to be able to work together. Like the simplest rigged one, like a fore and aft rig schooner, still had to have like eight people in order to make it sail efficiently. And that's like the bare minimum for how many people you would need. And on a big square rigged ship, you would need many, many more people than that. And you'd need them to be organized into watches. You'd need someone to be in charge of the food. Like you couldn't actually have chaos and be effective as a sea raider. And so the articles spelled out the obligations to one another. The captain would be chosen by popular acclaim, although, of course, popular acclaim then, as it is now, is often subject to other, you know, whims. But the captain would be chosen by popular acclaim. There would also be a quartermaster who was in charge of, you know, materials and goods on the ship. There would be someone who was a bosun who was in charge of keeping all the apparatus of the ship in good order. There would be usually a doctor if they could find someone who was qualified enough to be a doctor. There'd be someone who was a cook. Sometimes the person who was a cook was someone who maybe wasn't really cut out to do other more active forms of piracy. So William Fly's crew, for instance, the kid who was a cook was an alcoholic. He was a, you know, a just like blind drunk and was so drunk that he couldn't even participate when they staged the mutiny. But they let him be the cook anyway. Or the other example is Long John Silver from fiction. Long John Silver was actually the ship's cook, and the original title of Treasure Island was actually The Ship's Cook, a story for boys. The reason that Long John, whose nickname in the book is Barbecue, the reason that he was the ship's cook was because he only had the one leg. The article spelled out how much someone could be, should be given basically as hazard pay if they lost a limb. There are specific amounts accorded to like the loss of a leg or the loss of an arm and how long someone could stay in the crew after they were mutilated in this way. And it spelled out the fact that the crew were supposed to basically collectivize and pool all of their goods that they seize whenever they capture the ship. There were incentives spelled out for people to keep an eye out for ships to raid. So if you were the first person to spot a ship that wound up being an effective target, you would get first choice of the arms on board when everything was done. And there were also specific rules laying out that you were not to cheat one another. Within the articles, there is a structure in place to try to create some semblance of trust within this community of people. And it's one reason that you see examples of pirates in this time period at times joining forces together. So Steady Bonnet raiding with Blackbeard, and then they split apart and they, they raid apart, or raiding in the form of a fleet. And of course, you need to have some kind of internal organization. You need to have leadership and you need to have structure in order for that to be an effective strategy. There's no reason to think, as you point out, that an illegal operation wouldn't be organized and hierarchical. Mafias are and other organizations like that. Otherwise, it couldn't function. 
I suppose it leads us to the life of Blackbeard, which we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss. And he's an interesting example of somebody who does operate effectively both by organizing a ship, but by using his image instead of always resorting to violence to terrorize other people. And could we say his theatrics lead into our ideas of how we imagine pirates to be today? And so looking at Edward Teach's life, what's fat, what's fiction? And because him is the apotheosis of the classical age of piracy, I suppose he's a good avatar for a lot of these discussion points. He certainly is. I mean, one thing I was struck the other day because I have a very young son and for his birthday, he, as you can imagine, the young son of someone who's been working a lot on pirates recently, he is obsessed with pirates. My house is full of foam swords and pirate hats. And I got him a pirate ship toy for his birthday. And I was assembling it for him. And it says Blackbeard on the stern. And I was actually a little stunned by that because the more you learn about Edward Teach and his real life, the more appalling it is that we romanticize him as much as we do. But you're right, first of all, that his image, he used his image and the threat of his violence and the sort of terrifying nature of his aspect to increase his effectiveness. So he's called Blackbeard because he has this huge weedy kind of some of the engraved images of him from the 18th century show it as like sort of in corkscrews or almost as if it's been in, in locks, you know, raining down the front of his chest, that he would supposedly stick lit matches into his hat whenever he was attacking. Seems kind of impractical. But nevertheless, that detail shows up in a couple of different primary sources. So who can say? So Blackbeard, but make no mistake, Blackbeard was also like a real son of a bitch. I mean, he, you know, was kind of infamous for the depredations that he did on the coast of the Carolinas. He was a rapist. He was like a virulent, violent, terrifying rapist who kind of rampaged his way through the countryside. But interestingly enough, he also had a very multi-ethnic crew. In fact, I think about a third of his crew when he finally was captured or finally went down, about a third of his crew were men of color. And one of his crew was so loyal that he was all set to light a match and blow up the powder magazine on the ship before he was talked out of it by someone who was imprisoned in the hold next to him. There's also, I mean, this is me talking as my only hobby outside of being a writer and history person is um, sailing. And there's a pretty, to my mind anyway, funny moment of engagement with Blackbeard because any sort of chase scene between two sail-powered vessels can actually be excruciatingly slow if the wind is really light. And so there's a scene in which Blackbeard is being chased by, I want to say, like the government, essentially, like the colonial government. And But there's very little wind. And so they're, they're going incredibly slowly. And at one point, they get run aground in mud. So they're far apart. They're raining, you know, cannonball and shot at each other. And one of the ships has a very low freeboard. So there's nothing really for them to hide behind. And then they start, one of the ships has a lower draft than the other. And so they start throwing everything overboard to make themselves lighter. Because once they're lighter, they can get closer to Blackbeard. And so there's this kind of funny desperation to it of like exactly how even the most brutal people in the maritime world are still at the mercy of the elements whenever they're battling each other. Moving from the most romanticized period, although as you know, even the most romantic period is still pretty ugly. By the time we get into the 19th century, piracy isn't about going after goods sailing across the high seas and fancy wares to a gentleman's estate. It seems much more thuggish in behavior. You're roughing up crews, stealing money, capturing slave ships, doing human trafficking. It's a little bit more like carjacking, honestly, is what it looks like. Like Whereas golden age piracy is more like a Brinks heist, I think if we're going to make a 20th century comparison... I would say that early 19th century piracy is much more like carjacking. Right. It's very best. We could say it's like an Ocean's Eleven if we're being incredibly generous to what piracy could be. Oh, I would even put that too high. I think it's much more along the lines of like desperate person who happens to be armed, you know, takes your stuff. Right. And now it's a uh, street gangs or whatever, or Jeffrey Chaucer highwaymen when we get later in the 19th century. And so we see it recede. One of the first wars in the United States are against the Barbary pirates to destroy them. Piracy is eclipsed by more powerful navies. So ultimately, why does the age of piracy end? And are there any legacies from this three-century stretch that you cover? 
I think there are a couple of reasons. I mean, one is the change in colonial organization in the Americas. You know, as you have fewer and fewer treasure galleons, Spanish galleons leaving from what is now Panama and going across the Atlantic, as the nature of maritime trade changes. It's true that the war against the Barbary Coast pirates winds up being kind of an excuse for the new United States to gin up a navy. It was also, in in a funny way, as I alluded to the Barbary pirates earlier, as being kind of not exactly like pirates the way we would talk about Blackbeard. They're pirates more like warlords, like ocean-going, like guys working on behalf of warlords. But how different is that really from the way that the new United States government, which took in most of its money by port taxes, it's not actually all that different, especially given if you have the perspective that you know, England probably had, which was that the United States were you know, a rebellion, the result of a rebellion. So the finances are actually not that dissimilar. It's a little bit funny to me that we use the word piracy to talk about the Barbary Coast in the early 19th century. But so part of it was the change in colonial organization. As Spain's holdings started to fracture in the Americas, you get some interesting moments in the early 19th century when piracy is conducted under forged letters of mark. So, for instance, the reason that Jean Lafitte established himself on Galveston Island, which is off the coast of Texas, is because in the 18-teens and into the 1820s, Mexican Texas was still... Mexico had been struggling for its own independence from Spain. Of course, shortly thereafter, Texas would struggle for its independence from Mexico, largely because Texas wanted to retain the legality of slavery and Mexico wanted to outlaw it. And so there are moments of time when pirates are raiding, for example, under letters of mark from Cartagena, where Cartagena was trying to insist on its independence from Spain, and Spain was denying that Cartagena had the authority to issue letters of mark. And so part of what changed was there was this constantly shifting sphere of legality versus illegality. And partly what changed was the consolidation of increasingly powerful navies. So the British Navy retains a lot of power. The United States begins to have a navy that actually has some power of enforcement. And in fact, many of the primary sources that are in the Penguin Book of Pirates in the 19th century are about these kind of uh, renegade guys who end up being put down by the United States Navy as it is increasingly in the interest of the young United States to have calm on the seas because they want to conduct uninterrupted trade with the Caribbean and also with Europe and points east. Well, there's a rich history here. As we said, pirates are fixture of history, part of the wallpaper of history. And this is a particular era which it was particularly robust. Hopefully it doesn't make a comeback, at least not to the degree that we saw at that time period. Well, for listeners who want to check out many more facts about piracy. The name of Catherine's book is The Penguin Book of Pirates. Catherine, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that is all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes for this and all my other episodes and include sources, maps, or other relevant information, go to parthenonpodcast.com. Parthenon is the name of the podcast network that History Unplugged is a part of, along with other great history shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other shows as well. 